So I am indeed tasked with uh, moderating this discussion now, but I, I, I also now feel really hesitant to play Stuart Brand in all of this. I feel like I am somehow like an impresario who's uh, sort of like imposing himself on this conversation. And I know that we do have some uh, somewhat limited time, so I do want to make sure that we get to questions in just a moment here. Uh, but I do have sort of like an initial idea, and I, I haven't really planned this out ahead of time, but it's, um, I'm kind of curious to get the sort of like take from the, the panelists on maybe, uh, you know, and in, in maybe moving away from the rhetoric of modernism towards the sort of like how it is that we talk about the historical versus neo-avant-garde in a certain sense. And I'm interested in that, first of all, because how it is, that, uh, Andrew, and you, you've set up this, this quite nicely in terms of one of the goals of the hippie era is to integrate art in everyday life. And certainly when we talk about you know, what the goals of the historical avant-garde were, that we say that this is one of the, the primary goals. But we also talk about this notion of failure, right? And how the historical avant-garde failed, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so this is another recurring theme that we have here. And so I'm kind of like, I'm, I'm taken with this idea. But I'm also taken with this idea of how it is that, um, and I'm just thinking through this now too, how it is that um, when uh, Hal Foster talks about the neo avant garde, he talks about it. He wants to get away from this idea of failure, right? He's interested in how it is that uh, the historical avant garde was thought of as, as this traumatic moment, right? And that we replay these traumatic moments sometimes, right? Um, and so he thinks of this as a, in terms of sort of like anticipations and, and delays, right? Mm -hmm. And so I'm kind of curious about this notion of um, the, the sort of like the lingering impact of this hippie moment. And all of you talk about this in sort of different, in different fashions, right? About how it is that the, the, uh, like the, these moments from the 1960s have, have come back again, or maybe they haven't come back, but there's a sort of uncanniness to the return in a certain sense. Um, so I'm sort of curious if we could sort of expand on that a little bit, again, to sort of like move away from this idea of um, success or failure um, and to talk about, again, maybe, uh, the, the, again, this sort of the, the, the uh, enduring legacy a little bit. I know that's open-ended, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think the, the uh, you know, to think about uh, the past, I mean, it's not simply, you know, redoing the past. It's, it's more a question, I think this was touched on by everyone, the transfiguration of old ideas and concepts into the mm -hmm. present and how, um, you know, and, and why Stuart Brand might be haunting all of these <laughs> discussions <laughs> as a figure that, you know, as a transitional figure that helps bridge, um, you know, the, maybe what the Felicity was calling the last, you know, the last form of the counterculture in terms of mm -hmm. cyber culture. Um, but um, so I'm more interested, you know, in, in how uh, larger systems of transfiguration happen, but also in the narrative that utopia is, is always a kind of intellectual, unreachable proposition. Mm. To, so success is, you know, it's a Sisyphusian task. You, it, it requires redoing. It requires uh -huh. rebuilding. And then within that redo, I think there's movement. I mean, the, the trajectory shifts, and we don't know exactly what will happen unless you're a complete pessimist and that the system will always sort of self-correct. Mm -hmm. right. um, but I, I was more captured by the utopic potential within these and not mm -hmm. um, as, as actions by people making things right. As, right. as being the primary driver. Yeah, yeah listening to you um, raise the uh, question of, to me, of, of um, what this exhibition would look like if it was titled uh, hippie avant-garde rather than hippie modernism, because yeah. of course the you know the dialectic between the modernism, the avant-garde, and in mm -hmm. the interwar period <laughs> it would complicate your right. narrative yeah. significantly. And yeah. and uh, I mean uh, certainly in 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 architecture for which a type of generally avant-garde practice is you know even more difficult to articulate vis-a-vis -vis the um, uh, dominant socioeconomic apparatus given mm -hmm. architecture's role socially. Um, and I. And I, yeah, I don't know where I'm going with that, but 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 it it, it struck me that the that narrative from art history um, is troubled when it encounters architecture and design practice, and Clearly, and yeah. so one would have to begin to to ask those questions um, about that. But to answer the the temporal question, I often and increasingly with hesitation describe. Um, my historical scholarship as telling a type of cautionary tale, and mm. i.e., uh, clearly the motivation for rethinking what was going on in the 60s and 70s is precisely the degree to which very many strategies, images, forms are 
recurring, familiar, you know, increasingly capturing the imagination of uh, younger generations. And, and so I see it in a way as, as a, a task of trying to understand with some specificity the way in which practices of the 60s and early 70s were very precise in, in their uh, engagement, you know, sort of tactical engagement with structures mm -hmm. of power, whether they be institutional, technological, or, or quite literally figuring a type of playing ground in order that that, that type of complexity is uh, put forward as a, as, a, as a model. So precisely what you said, when you look at the, the, the plywood dome and see it as formal, uh, something to be appropriated in that register, uh, it, it fails miserably as a, a, right. a, a, you know, as having traction on the present. But if one begins to, to actually ask what it was doing um, uh, in a political register, then it begins to offer other lessons. And so, again, mm -hmm. in a scholarly register, these are the, the types of maps that I attempt to, to draw as ways of suggesting um, that, that those types of complications might also persist and be updated. Mm -hmm. you know, we live in a different historical moment. It's not self-evident, and it's also much more difficult, of course, to identify those um, uh, you know, contours of power in the present. Yeah? So, and, and this mm. is not, you know, it's, it's a call for designers, people who actually have to you know, engage with them in a very different register to produce mm -hmm. in, you know, new strategies. Um, but also, just one last thing, and then I'll stop. Um, when you presented the Stuart Hall material, mm -hmm. the grid, this I was, I yeah. was like, oh my word! You know, we are all by necessity stuck in the straight column here because, yeah. uh, as writers, <laughs> expected to argue and rationalize our readings, are sort of fantastic, and people who produce text, not images, and um, and so I <laughs> <laughs> felt incredibly self-conscious about what exactly, um, uh, yeah, we were, yeah, where we were being situated. But, so, but anyway. of course. Uh, <laughs> anyone who writes, and many hippies did write, yeah, uh, yeah. including Stuart Brand, I mm. mean, where would they fit in that uh, uh, structure? Know. So, yeah, <laughs> that's, I think, a flaw in the binary yeah. Yeah, construction. Yeah, yeah. Well, he was arguing, you know, like moments, so that one could adopt a position and then in one moment. Mm. So one could actually be both a politico and, and a hippie, right? Yeah. And this, of course, these two figures are joined historically in the yippie, right, in right. the yippie movement. Yeah. So mm. I do talk about that in the essay, but not, not here. But also <laughs> this idea of the failure of modernism, if, uh, as you say, we shifted to the notion of the avant-garde, we saw in that image of uh, Jerry Brown's first administration, people like Sim van der Rijn going from teaching uh, outlaw builders to becoming the first state architect of California, right. and then that making steps all the way up to the solar panels on the White House roof. I mean, mm -hmm. you could say from Drop City to the White House roof, that's a real trajectory of successes that were, of course, overturned by the Reagan Ronald Revolution. Reagan, right, yeah. 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 Repping them off the White well, House roof. I mean, but <laughs> another thing, too, is like, I mean, when we're, I mean, if we're going to, um, I, I mean, I sort of started by introducing the um, rhetoric of the avant-garde here, but another thing that we could talk about then is like, maybe it's succeeded too well, right? I mean, like, mm -hmm. if you're interested in outlaws and in-laws, I mean, this is what Peter Berger would call false sublation of art, right? It was, you know, like, you know, art is integrated into everyday life, but in such a way that it's done in a sort of spectacular way, perhaps, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so maybe, again, uh, there are aspects of hippiedom that have succeeded too well in the sense that they've been integrated. And into aspects life. of the neo-avant-garde. Right, absolutely. Uh, you yeah. know, in case yeah, you yeah. haven't noticed, art is very, very big business right. and yeah. uh, very spectacular. Yeah. So, it, so <laughs> right. it's kind but of... No, I mean, this is why the introduction of the TED Talk was so interesting to yeah. me, just yeah. because, yeah. again, like, you just look at that. I mean, this is very much the same rhetoric of sort of, like, hippie life style, but at the same time, for very different ends. Anyway, but that's... Yeah. Well, it is, but it, it is, it's also a pretty straight lineage. Uh, yeah. The, uh, yeah. A speaker at the first ever TED conference was uh, Stuart Brand. Okay. <laughs> 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 it's like, you know, technology education. I hope he's not getting paid and... for every time we mention <laughs> his name. We want royalties. <laughs> we'll be right. passing out $20,000 <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Nor did you mention he lived in Sausalito on a houseboat. That's, That's true. true. Yeah. Right, exactly. So, but one of the <laughs> things that, what, what's exciting about this, to go back to the thing about the neo-avant-garde and, and the sort of hippie modernism, is uh, to see uh, post-war, I was going to say art history, but it's kind of history, isn't it, being remapped. So that right. a firewall that was pretty well maintained, mm -hmm. and you could say, for example, by that essay by Ros Krauss, or trying to put, put, the, put works in kind of one camp or another, could be sort of New York, mm -hmm. New York versus California. Um, I teach at the University of California, Davis, and uh, the Davis School of Artists, who were pretty well known, had a famously antagonistic relationship back with New York mm. 
uh, one of the artists that Davis said uh, did um, uh, a sculpture of himself um, as a California artist, you know, as a hippie, as a, a, and put it in a gallery in New York as if to say, you know, there, that's what, that's what you think we are. Mm. So there has been a sort of firewall and uh, one of the jobs that we have to do as art historians, well, it's twofold. One is to sort of redraw that map a bit because people turn up in different contexts. And I think, you know, a great mm. example of that is Robert Smithson, who we see appear yeah. again in the gallery. And right. yeah. I'd always thought of, you know, Smithson as the, as the quint quintessence for sort of neo-avant-garde mm -hmm. artist. Mm -hmm. right. And the, when I saw him, you know, years ago, um, talking about reading the whole Earth catalogue and talking about looking down on a landscape from an aircraft mm -hmm. and saying, what do I do? How do I compete with that? Uh, almost the exactly the same creation story as the whole Earth catalogue. Stuart mm -hmm. Brandon on an aircraft saying, well, how mm -hmm. do I, what do I do? Yeah. So this all sort of slowly got, starts to get uh, reconfigured, remapped. Mm -hmm. And oh, the other thing is, as well as be it being a problem for art history, which may or may not be of interest to an audience, I think it's also a problem of history at large, and that is the difficulty trying to categorize almost anything that we've talked about and that we're looking at in the show as being art history exactly. Yes, <laughs> yeah. Talking yeah. to several of uh, the veterans of the period over mm. dinner last mm. night, they're saying, well, you see, this is the thing with art history. You want it to be kind of this, when actually it's this and it's Plus, that. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so that things are constantly kind of slipping from one category to another to another. Mm -hmm. To put it another way, it's, um, it's history. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's as opposed, you know, as opposed to art history right. or aesthetic history. Yeah. And how odd it is that this is art history and art, but the three panelists are architectural historians. How did that happen? <laughs> Andrew. Did we show any buildings? <laughs> <laughs> Shacks. Right. Outlaw buildings. It's outlaw so it's buildings. not architectural history either. No. No, I mean, and that's, you know, you know, try to cover in the catalog is the, ex, uh, you know, the elimination. Uh, most of yeah. the period was actually formulated under psychedelia and psychedelic mm -hmm. art, which is the f kind of maybe a first phase of this, but certainly does not cover countercultural production at mm -hmm. large in, in all mm -hmm. segments. Right. And so I, I guess part of that's you know I joke, you know it was like oh it's a Walker show because there's no boundaries. So I, so you okay. you would have some paintings, you have to have some paintings. We, we figure, yeah, but um, <laughs> and then you have to have other things, right? Yeah, yeah. but it does make look ro like Ross Krauss's expanded field diagram okay. to look mm -hmm. extremely limiting at that point <laughs> yeah. as well. So, um, uh, looking at the time that we have left, I do want to make sure that we get uh, time for uh, questions from the audience as well. So I don't want to cut off. Who we can't here. see because of the I know it's a little hard to see. So if you can just like, uh, I guess yeah. I'm. Uh, so it, there's somebody with a microphone because we're, we're webcasting. And I see. Uh, yeah. So I see Lorraine has a question. Okay. Making. Mm -hmm. um, or wait. Oh, that helps. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Lisa. We can start with Lisa. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you for the really amazing presentations and also the fantastic show. I could camp here for the rest of the <laughs> round. <laughs> it's uh, an so, outlaw territory. Um, <laughs> my question is more uh, for Andrew. As you said, um, the term hippie modernism is more of a moment in history than sty about styles. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if to you this is mostly a Western moment because in Mm -hmm. In the East, especially in Japan, like the non-art and the anti-art movements in the 60s and 70s, they also embraced the everyday and moved away from the object-based production to the more mm -hmm. action-oriented um, performance. Except perhaps the term hippie doesn't seem as applicable to the Japanese artists or mm -hmm. Your work, especially with the list of vocabulary you showed, I quickly ran through them. Uh, two terms, uh, two <laughs> phrases. Um, let me see. The relaxed and pleasurable. They don't seem as applicable. Uh, the, the Japanese work seems more gravitated towards the dark, the tense, the intense, and sometimes even very clinical. So that could be a reason for exclusion. But basically, my question is, I like to hear. Uh, more uh, your view about this possible moment of 
hippie modernism outside of the Western world. Yeah, I mean the exclusion probably isn't like uh, philosophical as much as horrible pragmatics about getting things. But um, mm -hmm. th th there were, of course, uh, Kusama would be, you know, an expat, um, sure. Ono. Um, so you you have you have the ink. I think the question is, where do you encounter the countercultural ethos, you know, for Japanese artists? And so, for a lot of artists, uh, of course, um, Oidesika was in New York um, at that time in the early '70s. So they have a they have a different contact point. And there were some films that I wanted to include from Japanese filmmaker um, that were part of the countercultural scene and and part of independent cinema at that time. So there, there actually are reference points that are that are in the show exactly, but. Um, I think it has more to do with that, and also um, the post-war condition in Japan, um, having been, you know, literally ground zero mm -hmm. in World War II, there would be a different, I think, psychology. Mm -hmm. So when I think of movements like Utai or other other movements, I see a different kind of impetus there than, say, the the kind of affluence that allowed mm -hmm. the outlaw territory to be seized mentally and then physically by largely white middle class uh, youth. You know who were inheriting. You know inheriting um, the, the the greatest generation's work, <laughs> whatever you want to call yeah. it. <laughs> you know that's their inheritance, and that's that's what we would expect. Yeah, I mean it's also experienced differently within the West too. I mean Italy that I work on. I mean there's a big. I mean it's a, us Italianists kind of wondered like were there hippies in Italy? You know, and there were capelli lunghi, so long hairs, right? Uh, but it was a much more urban sense than it was yeah. uh, in America as well. So even there are sort of like tensions and differences within the West as well. And so, yeah. but again, the the show itself sort of captures a lot of that. I think the sort of the, the yeah. it's so experienced you, differently. The counterculture was. So, yeah, yeah. So like Atari Sotsas was in in San Francisco and came into contact with B culture mm -hmm. and then exported B culture and late B culture back into Italy, um, and then gave that a different vibe. But we we kind of joked too. We discussed too that the European take on um, you know countercultural activity like the generation of the concept of the negative utopia would probably only come from Europe you know mm -hmm. out, out of out of more of a Marxist tradition but also right. again in Europe a, an emphasis on urban urbanity mm -hmm. as as the site I mean there's 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 very few places to colonize you know we have the American West we have the desert we have all these expansive spaces to colonize so the the, the things that were built and the kinds of territories that were claimed were very different when in like Italy is very yeah. much about um, urban, the urban condition, you know, right. the, the degradation of the urban condition. Let's see a few other questions. So, uh, I think Lorraine's uh, hand was up a while ago. So, <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, so there's, there's a mic coming towards you. Um, it's, I woke up this morning trying to parse out hippie modernism <laughs> myself after seeing the show and um, and so I'm fascinated that you right away brought up like well, wouldn't it be hippie avant-garde mm. and all that. But I, and I, I don't really have a question, but just I wanted to throw something onto the table, which is um, I'm kind of only halfway through Helen Molesworth's latest project about Black Mountain College, the mm -hmm. catalog for Leap Before You Look, and and it made me uh, think a lot about. Um, I guess actually it's funny because where I started with wondering about this was the pedagogy of design mm -hmm. and design thinking and clearly oh, yeah. mm -hmm. the Absolutely. connection of so much of this mm -hmm. period's work coming out of universities and like the stuff about Berkeley. Mm -hmm. But you know when you look at Black Mountain and you see uh, Merce Cunningham alongside Bucky Fuller, mm -hmm. to me it raises this question of again of well what do we call modernism yeah. and, and what mm -hmm. the connection of like progressive education and the idea of the process overall. Absolutely. I mean when I think of the early 70s art makers, the minimalists and those lists of processes mm -hmm. and rules that generated work, it's true they might not be looking for outlaw spaces but they were using this kind of open-ended framework. So I don't know, I, I think that question again goes back to just how many degrees or variations on the word modernism there are mm -hmm. and how to me this work still speaks of the experimental and the process driven that seems to kind of come back to new thoughts in education that really come after the war. Mm -hmm. That's all I wanted to It's a comment, I know, but can I have a, a, st a stab at that because it's very well put and um, so it's a bit like, you know, which is the real Bauhaus? 
Is it, is yeah. it Johanna Zitten, <laughs> right. vegetarian, dressed like a monk, having his students do eurythmics on the roof? Or is it, is it Tube of Steel Chairs, which is how we tend to teach it? Um, and, and of course, at the same time, the Bauhaus is in a way a continuation, although it looks co completely counterintuitive, of a project of the arts and crafts and of William Morris. And of course, if William Morris had seen where his project ends up, he would have been mm. completely horrified. So <laughs> what then is binding all of these things together? And it would seem to me, I mean, I don't want to be too reductive, but it is the core project, the big project, the big modern project is the belief that art and creativity and design and culture change the world. That they're not products of a world, but, they, but, they, but they're, pra they're practice. And, uh, and that seems to be, to, I mean, I'm sure we could, we could say, well, look, I mean, there's other times and other places in the world where this has happened as well. Okay, but I do think that there is a continuity and it's probably associated with the long revolution uh, after the industrial revolution, scientific revolution, commercial revolution, technological revolution. But in that broad arc, I cannot help but see these uh, successive movements and moments as variations on a theme. And so I don't, I don't actually get too kind of hung up. All of these labels are just, they're all, oh gosh, now I sound like Stuart Brown again. They're all tools. <laughs> uh, so they kind of help us get something done, which is to figure out what's going on. Uh, but, you know, once, they're, once you've used the tool, you, know, you put it to one side. <laughs> <laughs> just a small, um, uh, just since you mentioned the Bauhaus, um, I'm teaching a class at the moment at Columbia called Geographies, Territories, and Environments of Modernism that tries precisely to expand modernism from a you know interwar Euro-American phenomena into a, a global context and to ask to what degree that troubles, overcomes, dismantles, adds you know like to, to, to think through various ways of understanding that. And we um, were reading, um, we were asking this question through the Bauhaus, and of course once you mm -hmm. trace. Um, Bauhaus figures who don't only go to Chicago, but of course to Latin America, uh, to North Africa, you know, to Palestine, to, you know, one gets a type of picture that also radically undermines even the opposition between it and, and broad, you know, I mean, it's like, uh, and so, you know, what is modernism? And, and on the one hand, you know, each of those uh, types of other modernisms is um, uh, produced out of, you know, weird personal uh, trajectories and often tragedies. Um, they still do, you know, refract back into <laughs> what we now really have to imagine as, as modernism and as legacies. And, and so I think it's a great question, maybe one that ties back to the question about how to think uh, hippies in, in the context of uh, post-war Japan. And, mm -hmm. and so, and it, and it um, anyway, that's my addition to that thought. <laughs> See a hand right here. Uh, <clears throat> hi, thanks for the amazing presentation. So I have a, a question that, I don't know, I, I, I'm just curious to hear some responses from the panel on this. I love the side-by-side um, -side comparison of the Black Panther um, ideas and totally different approaches to the uh, hippie strategies. And um, something that just sort of stuck in my mind, and I'm curious, what do you guys think about this, was this question of relationship with the uh, Native American or Indian culture, right? right. There's yeah. obviously this sort of playful embrace happening, but we are talking about predominantly white middle class movement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, even during the conversation, you guys were using terms like colonizing the land, it's about mm -hmm. taking the land, taking yeah. ownership yeah. of it. It's a complicated set of ideas, and there is a kind of deeper current there that I mm. didn't hear discussed. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd, I'd like to, uh, if I could, uh, give my response to that, which is, you know, one of the problems with hippie culture and trying to look at it has always been making our sort of judgments based on the lowest common denominator. And so for all of the playful dress up and the appropriations, many of them very ham-fisted of uh, Native American culture, there were people like Jack Loeffler, who worked with Stuart Brand <laughs> and who actually ended up in New Mexico, who introduced Stuart Brand to a lot of things about Native American culture, who became an ethnomusicologist, 
who uh, essentially fought very hard for uh, against uh, mining on Black Mesa, which was a piece of uh, uh, territory that was sacred to Native Americans, uh, who brought Native American issues to the uh, first uh, UN Conference on the Environment in Stockholm and brought actually Native Americans to it. So I think we have to be pretty careful that we uh, look at a full spectrum of these practices and these uh, sort of uses and uh, interest in Native American culture. And actually that's one, I think, of the important things about work on uh, hippies and hippie avant-garde and hippie modernism now is to really develop a, a kind of new history that isn't always uh, looking at that case study mm -hmm. that becomes the media narrative because it's just so flamboyant and crazy mm -hmm. and to look at the real yeah. spectrum of practices. Well, I'll just add a footnote to that. I mean, uh, part of um, part of the issue at stake for me, I mean, Brand, of course, is very much at the center of this. And he even writes <laughs> like the Smithsonian's entry to hippies and Native Americans in the 80s. You know, he. Um, sets himself up through, I mean, one of his first light shows is the American Eat Indians Project in 66 at the Trips Festival. And, and he does, I think, I mean, uh, spectacularize what might be, what might be um, received about Native American culture in, a, in, to my mind, a very problematic way, including taking the Black Mesa and other groups and the Navajo to, to, to uh, yeah, to Stockholm. Mm -hmm. And so there, instead of being able to articulate their questions as, rights-based struggles, they are put forward as people that, you know, have alternative, you know, and so, so I think, you know, it's not enough to take um, indigenous questions to Stockholm when one spectacularizes them. It's, you know, it, in fact, works often counter to, um, I think, any type of self-determination. Uh, I mean, so I, and I think, you know, again, it's a complicated narrative, but, yeah, it's something that, that I've been struggling with also around the Stockholm question. And um, yeah, I don't think it's, I mean, it's a little bit more cynical. And I mean, you know, it has that same type of double edge like the Black Panther example. So, right. Yeah. Uh, and Brand was yeah. uh, married to a woman of Native yeah. American ancestry. Exactly, Lois, yeah. So, and, yeah. and it alludes a little bit to a, something we were talking about over lunch, which is uh, Felicity's work mm -hmm. on Bernard Rudofsky, who, uh, was famous for the for the exhibition and catalog architecture without architects, which was a you know kind of standard reading of the of the hippie movement, and uh, we were talking about the problems of race around Rudofsky. So I'm not going to try and uh, summarize uh, what what Felicity was saying, except to say that the conversation was you know how, how problematic this always is. On the one hand, uh, it it takes no time at all to show that. Uh, there is a kind of st structural racism, right? Mm -hmm. And it's a colonial project. I said earlier about, you know, Stuart Brand mm -hmm. appearing in a pith hat, you know, the sort of, <laughs> the, the insignia of, the, of, the, of, of British imperialism. Um, one of the things that, I, I'm, that, I'm, that I'm never quite sure how to handle, though, is that there is nevertheless a, a, a sort of naive and, and maybe hapless but nonetheless, some attempt to empathize with the other mm. and to, um, and to, to recognize um, some sort of equality. You know, I'm sounding like uh, a liberal and it, um, and it alludes to the agonies uh, that our colleague Fred Turner has, mm -hmm. uh, especially in a new project that he has around the family of man, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where, you know, uh, the, the standard response at the moment to the legendary family of man mm -hmm. exhibition, which again fed into hippies, mm -hmm. into hippiedom, the standard response at a, at, a, at, a, at a research university will be, well, you know, sort of racist, right? But one of the things that, that Fred wants to say is, yes, but, and he has terrible problems mm -hmm. in conversations and seminars and conferences around this. Mm -hmm. And that he's kind of offered himself as kind of, you know, the sacrifice on this because he's, <laughs> he's saying, yes, but, but there is really mm -hmm. an attempt <laughs> to acknowledge a family of man. Mm -hmm. well, I, 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 okay, I don't even want to, I'm, now I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm on both sides of an argument, and I, it's beyond my pay grade. An, another, another way to get into this would be also to look at how Native Americans 
uh, were able to take some of these liberated yeah. territory mm -hmm. right. moves, for example, the occupation of Alcatraz Island, which uh, I think most historians agree was informed by many of the hippie sort of occupations of Absolutely. other things uh, in the Bay Area. So mm -hmm. in a sense, that was uh, a kind of uh, Native American, you know, sort of usage, or you can even say appropriation of hippie techniques of mm -hmm. spatial occupation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I do want to get to, there are a few other questions, and I see a hand right up here. Good. And it's, yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. It's a little dark. Uh, I'm uh, classically a contrarian, <laughs> and um, <laughs> I happen to have been there uh, for most of these things that you guys are talking about. Um, as far as Fred Turner is concerned, you know, he's written about us in both of his books. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the idea of the family of man and the influence of the Second World War on the emigration to this country and the origins of real democracy are fascinating from mm -hmm. Fred. Stuart Brand left the military and became part of USCO. America the in Needs Indians was an USCO project. Mm. And it emanated from his wife, Lois. Mm -hmm. And so did the catalog emanate from her work. Mm. And he abandoned her. OK. Mm. He has good ideas. Mm. But I resent the fact that both Felicity and you, Simon, credit Stuart, his role has been to become a millionaire through his intellectual and creative mm. ideas. Mm. I had hoped originally that this panel would be about art as art is represented in this exhibition. And I appreciate the fact that Andrew gave us some examples from the exhibit and that you, Mr. Casillo, um, were able to cite Bruce Conner's piece, which is a beautiful piece of work. And of course, he's in the show. But, you know, you, you seem to have concentrated more on politics mm. and on the social effects of hippiedom than on the art. The art is what we did and what put us in the embarrassing situation of being called hippies, beatniks, psychedelic artists, all of the above, and probably a few more. Hey, it's been wonderful. And to be here is even more wonderful. And I'm sorry to be so critical, but you know, part of the thing, I'm a refugee. So Fred's ideas about immigration strike me very strongly. I'm no longer a friend of Stuart's, but it was on my barge in Sausalito that Stuart lived. Huh? <laughs> you know, uh, on top of that, I was at Black Mountain. So there you go. <laughs> Well, I do, I do accept responsibility for um, trying to differentiate like what's in the gallery in terms of the art. You know, art does one thing and then uh, public conversation does another thing which allows us to place into a context, a cultural context, also a social and political context, a large variety of work. And, and one of the hard things about curating the show is moving from all of these areas that you know, the filmmakers are concerned about one thing, the painters are concerned about another, the graphic designers are another, the architects who claim to be architects are considered with yet another area. And then at one time you're looking at a, a highly integrated moment and trying to bring all of that back together. So, I mean, I understand what, you're, what you say there, but I think there's a real value into excavating some of these connections, particularly the things that we've just touched upon. Mm -hmm. Because one could imagine that you could do your lecture again about you know, the American Indian movement, which mm -hmm. was birthed mm -hmm. here in, in, in the Twin Cities, mm -hmm. um, and, and do that same lecture again, and to really take apart, um, to unpack 
this really complicated set of symbols and identities. I mean, the, the reason that I use the word modernism because I was originally interested in postmodernism. Mm. And how did that arrive, having closer to that era myself mm. than to say this era? But how do, how do we, how do we, what happened? How did we get a version? And again, that's biased through design and architecture's mm -hmm. version of postmodernism, which is highly historicized, highly depoliticized, um, and highly mm -hmm. stylized. Um, what happened? Because there, there's something that happened very early on with this, and so that's why I wanted to latch onto that word modernism, thinking of the continuity of the modern project. So I guess that's my bias, that there is a continuity. There's early modernism, which we may call the avant-garde, but that there's certainly this late modernism that happens, which this I would consider the first real public critique of modernism, which then begets this kind of postmodernism, which again gets transfigured because the social and political apparatus remains largely the same in that period. So it's trying to weave together this complex history, I guess is all I'm trying to say, is that it's aesthetic, <laughs> it's social, it's yeah. political, it's cultural, ultimately. So, I mean, I, I actually really appreciate that comment and that question. I mean, one of the things that uh, we're trying to emphasize is that this is a history that is in the writing and it's still, you know, so, so one of the points of having a conversation is to try and sort of get that right. My personal um, uh, slant is absolutely to see art and design in part, uh, as part of, you know, a larger cultural history. You know, elsewhere we've all written more precisely about the works themselves, art, art themselves, you know, especially uh, the architecture in my case, the art, the art architecture and design. Uh, so, yeah, we could have had a different conversation. It's true. As for the Stuart Brand thing, believe me, I, I, uh, I am personally horrified at my own fascination at the man. <laughs> and, uh, and it's the, it, but then, you see, that's the problem with kind of interesting, interesting people. If, you, if I was to introduce you to a lot of my friends, my friends are some of the most annoying people I've ever met, and, the, and the, that's what makes them fascinating. They have uh, sort of strongly held uh, opinions, or they're, they're difficult to nail down on things, or what their motivations are. And I'm, I, get, I am drawn to complicated phenomena and people, and, and, and this whole thing is a complicated phenomena populated by complicated people. And uh, I do think that, that, for now at least, in the writing of this history, Brand is unavoidable because he's like a Zelig type figure. He just keeps popping up. And that may be because he scripted the whole thing, right? And he scripted it with him as himself as one of the main characters. Well, that's okay. And through comments and criticisms, we'll get past that. It's in the same way that we're still, even tonight, or trying to figure out what the Bauhaus was. And we've been working on that now <laughs> for, what is it, 80 years? <laughs> but thank you, yeah. yeah. I mean, but ultimately you're right. I mean, like the, the, this idea of like who, I mean, to use your phrasing of in-laws and outlaws, I mean, like who is an in-law and who is an outlaw at any given moment is totally up for debate, right? And it's immensely uh, complex as well, so. Um, do we have time? I don't, I, I know that we're running short on time. I don't want to, I mean, yep. Sheila really this, wants um, to talk. I can tell. Oh, 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 sorry. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, awesome. yeah. oh, there's a microphone. There's a microphone yeah. coming your way. Uh, oh, well. <laughs> okay, my name is Clark Rickard, and I was at Drop City from day one. So is Richard, who I'm sitting mm -hmm. next to. He's at Drop City <laughs> from day one. And uh, <clears throat> I uh, have about seven things to say, but I'm only going to say two and a half. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, one thing I'd like to say is uh, I really uh, am bothered by the question of failure. Uh, I, I'm often asked, why did Drop City fail? And my answer to that is failure, it's about, it's the biggest success of my life. It was mm -hmm. one of the best experiences of my life. And I, and I compare it to Black Mountain College. Was Black Mountain College a failure? I mean, it only mm -hmm. lasted, what, 25 years? Mm -hmm. But I read an art forum a couple years ago that everything that is happening in the art world today is informed by things that were happening at Black Mountain College. And I don't know if that's totally true or not, but I can see some truth to that. So uh, I really, oh, and this is kind of related to failure, I often hear 
but the Drop City domes leak like a sieve. <laughs> but uh, the, the, my current studio, which is great, I love my studio. It's great in the building, an old warehouse. And it's got three leaks in it. It leaks. <laughs> but the car top dome where we painted the mm -hmm. ultimate painting, which is on exhibit here, I don't remember any leaks in that dome. So uh, that's a myth. That, I mean, maybe some domes leak like a sieve, but I don't remember leaking like a sieve being a major problem at Drop City. There was other problems, but not the leaking like a sieve. And if, it did, if there were leaks, I could live with it. I'm living with the current leaks in my current studio. It's fine. I love the studio. Uh, but also, I think the other myth is, is that we were creating housing. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we weren't creating yeah. housing. Mm -hmm. We were creating an artwork. Mm -hmm. A lot of the times we just lived in mm -hmm. cars <laughs> or tents <laughs> or got rained on, but we weren't, you know, form follows function, I guess. And we weren't following form and we weren't following function. We were following form, but we weren't following function. Mm -hmm. We were just creating ideas uh, for whatever reason we had. You know, there was so much mm -hmm. information coming through about um, geometry, about mythology, about uh, uh, artwork, but housing was the least of our problems. <laughs> and one of the main problems is that what we try to do is make them into housing, right? Mm -hmm. And that was an impossibility because, um, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't housing <laughs> and it was never I meant to be housing. We disagree on a lot of that. <laughs> <laughs> should take the microphone down here, though. Yeah. yeah. Right. yeah. yeah. I, I'm Tony Martin, and I was there at the Trips Festival, and I was uh, herded into the Fillmore West in the first days by the Hells Angels who called me Mr. Magic. <laughs> and I was Mr. Magic because I put together projectors in ways that people didn't think of usually. And I would take apart all of Kodak's equipment and put it back together the way I thought it might be interesting <laughs> to use it, you know? And I saw it. I made lenses that would cover the wall and maybe just part of it would curve off into an infinity. Mm -hmm. I'm saying this partly to say that the model for my work was not an idea. It was not Buckminster Fuller, Marshall McLuhan. It was more of an organic process of somehow feeling I was part of a bigger universe than Ronald Reagan and all of this stuff <laughs> I'd seen from the 50s. Now, all of what we're talking about, the problem of defining things is that you are making, you are making words, you're making categories. And, you know, it's much broader than that. I'm a New Deal child. Hmm. Woody Guthrie sang in my backyard. <laughs> you know, we were building strange shacks out in Roosevelt, New Jersey in 1948. Mm -hmm. You know, so the roots of what we're seeing in this show, to me, are very broad, including black culture, because I knew some really good black artists, and some of the people I worked with at the film were black, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I was an always, always an integrator, you know? My mother, you know, got black migrant workers to paperwork for their social security. That was in the late 40s, yeah. you know? 10 years later, I'm doing light shows for the Grateful Dead, you know? But that wasn't my main interest. I was much more interested in doing a visual composition with Terry Riley and Pauline Oliveros. It's what I was more intent on doing. Out of that whole thing, I make this thing that's in your museum called The Well. And it's really based a little bit on being in Roosevelt, New Jersey in 1948, mm -hmm. where people would come to a hub, you know? Mm -hmm. They came to the school with boxing gloves on sometimes, you know? It was a very, you know, a very wide community, a lot of immigrants from, from uh, Nazism and, and all of that. So it had its utopian, it had its ideals. But culturally and artistically, I really feel it's much more visceral mm. than what you're getting at. 
It's mm. visceral. It's experience as you grow up when you're four years old, you know, or you're 12 years old and you throw something together and, and you say, oh, this, this isn't right. And you destroy it. And out of that destruction comes something wonderful. That kind of out of adversity comes something wonderful. Now, I thought Stuart Brand didn't know this kind of stuff very well. Tell you the yeah. truth, <laughs> really? No, I mean he was like the philosopher. He's you know Diderot or somebody. He's, yeah, he's yeah. the philosopher. I mean, he's very good brain, but he didn't have the art passion. I don't think he had the creative passion yeah. as a lot of the people who are represented in this terrific show. Mm. You know, mm. so I just want to bring. It, it's not either or. It's both. Mm. Mm -hmm. You know, there's the hell's angels hurting me. You know. Mm. I was afraid of them, you know, but they became my friends. They were my protectors. How weird, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but anyway, the magic and the universal thing for me was in the visceral and, and, and instinct. I used to call it instinctivism. I gave great value to something I called instinctivism. I'd have a hard time defining it right now, but, uh, <laughs> but that's what I was going on. A lot of other artists at the same time were going on. They kind of invented uh, points of view, you know, invented points of view. Mm -hmm. So anyway, but this is, this is a wonderful show, and I really, I'm honored that The Walker is doing this because it does bring together, you know, all of this. Uh, I think it goes back to the caveman. And, you know, always if I give a lecture, I say the, the first multimedia artists were the people who lived in caves, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. That's the first multimedia. It's dance, painting your body, singing, making rhythms, uh, building structures, all of that in one thing, you know, 20,000 years ago. So, thank you. Thanks. Thanks. I know this wasn't your point, but, um, but one thing that your comments... Um, remind us of is that the firewall is not just um, uh, New York, California. Uh, yeah, I mean, Eva, it's, it's firstly within New York, within that region, but also um, between certain practices and you know, certain practices are distinctly yeah, disallowed from entering into that field. I mean, I re again, it's not your point, but, but I think it is a good reminder that the East Village, for instance, is also very much left out of the picture in New York in the 1960s. And, um, yeah. And also, the, it's an old antagonism uh, between artists or creators and art historians. I mean, it's um, <laughs> every phase of history uh, we have this. Or really, the antagonism between people standing up at a lectern and talking about something you really know about. For example, if you were there. It's like I often think as I read a newspaper in the morning, I'm like, you know, yeah, very interesting, very interesting. Mm. And then if a journalist tries to write about something that I really know about, it's like, eh, not so much. I mean, it's, uh, <laughs> I, I sort of recognize it. <laughs> um, and so there is always that, mm. if it's not a firewall, that it, it's, a, it's a shaky relationship between things as they were and are and things as we try to describe them, narrate them, you know. Well, I know we're short on time. We've gone a little bit over, but I just wanted to thank uh, oh, our panelists. Oh, wait, do we do but did this one more? Okay. <laughs> Sheila says we can end. So, so, okay, we can, we can talk to each other afterwards. Okay, so I wanted to thank our four fan, uh, panelists very much uh, for your time today, and I wanted to thank all of you for coming today. So thank you very much. Very thank much. You, Ross. <laughs> thank you.